Hello guys, welcome back to the Henry Holster Shop. Thank you for spending your Thursday evening with me. Tonight we're talking about good grind versus bad grind. Uh, but as usual, I have a tool tip and a little bit of preliminary uh, jabber, and then we'll get into the topic. So it seems like we finally reached autumn. The weather here at my shop has been cool the past couple days, which was really a relief. Yesterday we actually had a bit of a hailstorm which was an adventure. I actually ended up going inside the house and doing paperwork because the rain and hail on my metal roof was so loud that even with earplugs in, it was really hard to be out here and work. I couldn't concentrate. So here's the tool tip. If you are a holster maker, you work with molds, you're thinking about getting into CAD, you want to be able to take precise measurements, digital calipers. I'm a big fan of Mitutoyo brand. These are their IP67 model, which is coolant proof if you're using a CNC mill and cutting metal. Uh, it's probably overkill. This, this particular model is a little bit overkill for most Cadex holster makers, but um, the resolution is excellent. They're sturdy, dependable. Uh, I like them a lot. The, the manual scale on them is uh, pretty much just for general reference only because you can't really take measurements off that, but um, they work real well. I use them all the time. I've built whole CAD models um, for guns using uh, a good set of calipers, a good micrometer, uh, some radius gauges, a few other things. You can make very usable CAD models, um, but it's also good just for checking to make sure your molds are still in spec. Um, any kind of quick measurement that needs to be closer than an eyeball with a tape measure, these are great for. You can also check check depth of holes by dropping it in and dropping it till the foot hits the lip. It's not perfectly precise, but good enough for a lot of what we do. So uh, if you need measuring tools, get good stuff. Uh, the kind of digital caliper, calipers, generic ones you'll find at Lowe's or Home Depot or Menards are generally pretty junky. Um, they don't tend to last very long. And if their calibration gets squirrely and they don't hold measurement well, um, they're useless to you if they can't reliably scale out and scale back and stay on point. So I like Minitoyo. Minitoyo Sterrett is another very common brand used by machinists. Both of them make great calipers. Um, so if you're thinking about getting some, that is what I recommend. Hello, Ben Miller. Thank you for stopping by. I'm sitting a little closer to the big door of the shop tonight, hoping to pick up better Wi-Fi and not have any of those lagging video issues. Uh, also, when I was at IMTS, I got some cool stickers. Thank you, Ken Spaulding from Zodiac Engineering. It's on my water bottle. I love it. So I'm saying yours is junk, Mike Jolly. Well, if you got a $20 big box store special, then uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm a, I, I treat tools the same way I treat uh, the, the same way I treat guns. So if you're a holster maker, oh yeah, prelimi preliminaries. If you're a Codex holster maker, please post your company name in the comments so I can keep track of who is who. Uh, also, please like the feed and please share the feed. Hello, Jessica. Thank you for stopping by. Um, so the topic tonight is good grind versus bad grind. Hi, John Keller. And what I mean by good grind versus bad grind, I think it's easy for us to get as small business owners, as guys working in a shop or girls working in a shop, uh, to get into a kind of groove where we think grind is good. We just want to get in there and grind, 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 and do tons and tons and tons of work. Hey, Chris. Welcome, Spider Concealment. Um, and what I want to try to do tonight is break down when grinding is good and when grinding is bad, because not all grinding is created equal and some grinding is bad. So let me give you an example of good grinding. You've got a big order, um, you've got a mold set up, you've made some tests, everything's coming out the way you want, you get in the shop, you down your big cup of coffee, and then for 10 hours you're just in the zone. You're forming, trimming, drilling, folding, finishing, assembling, you're out there cranking and it's going well, you're making product, that's good grind overall. But even parts of that can be bad grind. And this is what I mean by bad grind. Bad grind is any time 
you are grinding in this cycle where you're doing something ineffective, inefficient, frustrating, or counterproductive, and you're not stopping and taking a step back and fixing it. Hello, Bill. Hi, Tony. Um, hello, Charles. Business and Holsters is in the house. And so what I mean by that, an example would be um, if you've got a mold set up and you're pressing shells and they're not coming out right. Something is shifted. They're just, you're just not happy with them. The definition's not good. Something's not working. And rather than taking a step back and trying to figure out what's going on and what you can do about it, you just put your head down and charge through it. I would call that bad grind. Not that charging through obstacles is necessarily bad, but charging through instead of problem solving is often part of bad grind. The other thing that gets a bad grind can turn into is, um, in my shop, I'm the only one here, so the whole place is set up the way I like. Tools are where I set them down. Nothing moves around if I don't move it, which is nice, but it also means when I lose something, there's nobody else to blame. It's totally on me, which is not so great. Um, one of the things that happens out here is as my shop gradually entropies into disarray, um, I start feeling very, um, it interferes with my ability to work quickly and effectively in the shop. I start feeling constricted. Uh, I generally am a fairly clean, orderly kind of person, although parts of my shop are messy. I tend to like my shop at a certain minimum level of cleanliness and order. And if it gets outside that, I start getting a lot more friction. And so, in some cases, bad grind is me not taking the time to focus, to get recentered, to take 10 minutes, sweep the floor, take out the trash, clear off a workbench, reorganize some tools. Um, you know, yeah, Jared Gomez with your bad grind puns. Um, Bad grind is when something is bothering me, and there's a problem, and instead of fixing it, I try to ignore it. I can't really ignore it, but I try to, and just keep going. Hello, Gary. And so, um, what good grind can produce is the work equivalent of tilt. Okay? Um, I always find if I'm trying to make something and I'm under time pressure, uh, earlier this week, this is totally stupid. I had a mold, a test mold, that had to ship that day. And in the morning, I got sucked into other projects, things that were useful, that were interesting, that were productive for the shop, but were not the critical thing. Um, and what happened is, about 11.15 in the morning, I realized, oh no, I have to ship that mold. And I cleared my plate. Everything else got set aside. And I was at the computer, I was finishing the CAD, I was doing CAM, I was prepping stock, I was you know, getting ready to put it on the machine, I was changing out vice jaws, I was doing all kinds of stuff. And I was in this situation where I had one shot to get it right because my, my mail lady was going to be there in 45 minutes. You know, I would not have time to uh, machine the mold, make a test holster, fold it up, check for fit, make changes, remachine, retest, and package in time. I would just have missed it. Thankfully, I got it right. It was good on the first run. I packaged it up and off it went. But that kind of letting myself get under the gun, letting myself get behind on a specific small deadline so that I have no opportunity, that there's no slack time, that there's no room to even do the careful quality control that I would like. That I'm just like, okay, that, that's good. It fits. It checks out. Good. Send it. Um, that's bad grind. Hello, Jordan. Hi, Eric Powell. Um, if you have a shop, I'm sure you understand the principle of entropy. Everything just gradually, you know, spreads out into nothingness and decay. And I find that if I don't regularly take five minutes and just circle up the shop, walk through, sweep some tables off, put some things back in the right place, hang some tools on the pegboard, that I start having trouble focusing, I get off my game if the shop is too disorganized. Um, and sometimes I'm off my game, sometimes I just have a bad day. Sometimes, sometimes stuff is just not working. 
I, uh, I had a funny incident at the, sh at the mill yesterday. I was prepping a piece of stock. I didn't have a lot of cut pieces of the correct size left. I was prepping a piece of stock. I had to drill a pattern of holes in it, flip it over on a fixture, machine the other side. And I got my, you know, I dialed up my Renishaw Pro on the machine. It came down. I touched off on all four sides, touched the top, found my work zero, hit the drilling program, and I watched it drill, and I could clearly see that it was misaligned. It was not centered on the part. And I was standing there going, I just probed that. I just measured center. How is that not? So put it out, fresh piece in, called up the probing program again, brought the probe down, touched off on all four sides in the top, found center, hit the drilling program, and again watched it drill off center in exactly the same way. And I was standing there going, am I losing my mind? What is going on with this thing? And I was so in a hurry to get through it that I wasn't even taking the time to step back and carefully read my program again. The program was really short, like 30 lines. And uh, yeah, there was one, uh, one error. I had programmed at the machine and I had uh, made a mistake. And so the machine was doing exactly what I was telling it, but I was so like in the grind, gonna hustle through it, gonna drive through it, that uh, I didn't recognize the mistake until I'd ruined two pieces that I needed. Um, Kyle is here. Yeah, so the idea that you always have to put in the maximum amount of time in the shop I think is counterproductive. If you're not making progress, grinding doesn't automatically improve the situation. If the work is not productive, doing that unproductive work harder isn't effective. Uh, I'm going to show my age. Classic movie reference, Aliens. Okay? There's a scene where Ripley's driving that weird combat mobile that the Space Marines have. And one of the guys just says, you know, ease down, ease down. You've broken the transaxle. You're just grinding metal. You know, she's got the pedal to the floor, and the thing's not going anymore. She burned it up, and she's just grinding. Um, John Keller says, usually when I mess up, it compounds. I have to step away and regroup. John, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Good grind is a persistent, dedicated focus on the goal with a willingness to for the sake of working smarter, step back from the maximum intensity for a few minutes and calm down, go outside, have a smoke, have a drink of water, chew some gum, do whatever it is that helps you and reassess. Get back on an even keel. Um, I don't think it's me either, Conrad. It doesn't seem to be freezing or giving me a weak connection signal at this end. Uh, the other thing is that bad grind is, I think, any grind that's not clearly focused on a big picture goal. I like Gary Vaynerchuk. I listen to his podcast. Um, he talks about an idea called clouds and dirt, which I think is very helpful. For, it's very helpful for me to remind myself. Clouds is the big picture going forward. What's the long term plan? Where I want to get? What I want to do? The dirt is the practical detail execution. It's polishing the edges, drilling the parts, buying new, buying new packaging, learning C and C. All that stuff is dirt. Clouds is the vision. It's very easy for grinding to become an end in itself. And as American entrepreneurs, we have this idea that it's part of our entrepreneurial spirit that our American hardworking. Um, producer maker mindset that grind is just good and grind is not necessarily good secret squirrel is here um, the idea that maximum time engagement equals maximum productivity is definitely not true if you're not getting enough sleep if you're not taking breaks for meals if you are getting through your days totally loaded up on caffeine and nicotine you're probably not doing your best work I know myself that if I have a couple days in a row where I didn't get enough sleep, the quality of my work goes down in a big hurry. And then it doesn't matter how many more hours I throw at it. I, I quickly max out my productivity, and after that, I'm just grinding. Um, hello, David Pryor. And so 
when I think about that kind of bad grind, which is unfocused grind, it's putting your head down and just charging in a direction. Um, what that turns in, what that, that's the equivalent of running really hard and really fast on a hamster wheel. It's not moving you toward your end goal. It's not getting you someplace. It's just spinning wheels. And so um, it's a discipline to step away from the grind for a few minutes and say, okay, I'm going to come back to this tomorrow. I'm going to set this project aside and come back to it in a week, in two. Uh, I'm going to just pause this. I'm going to go eat lunch. I'm going to go you know, print some invoices. I'm going to go handle some shipping labels. I'm going to go do something else. And I'm going to let myself have time to reset. And then I'm going to go for it again. Hello, Jim Hogue. Thank you for stopping by. Um, that's not a failure to grind. That's grinding smart. Okay? Really, the end goal is not effort. Effort is never the goal. Productivity is the goal. Output is the goal. If, um, if you approach your work with the goal being to put the maximum amount of time in, you will always put in tons of time, but there's no direct connection between that and productivity. So I spent a bunch of years uh, studying classical music. I'm a trained violinist and violist. I have my college degrees in classical music performance from the IU Jacobs School, which is a very, very highly regarded, very rigorous uh, and selective music school. I was not well taught as a student on how to practice. Hi, Tom. Um, and what I mean by that is I was not goal-oriented. I was process-oriented as a musician. And I was using the wrong metrics. And this is part of good grind versus bad grind. The way you assess what grind is good and what grind is bad, you have to have some kind of metric. You're looking at data, information of some kind. It could be how much money did I invoice this week? You know, how many orders did I fill? How many orders did I ship? How many new product ideas did I work on? How many prototypes did I get done? How many improvements off the big list, the big running list of shop improvements? How many improvements did I get through? The goal is never did I work the maximum number of hours. If 70 is good, 75 is better. No. If 80 is good, 90 is better. Maybe, but not necessarily so. And so as an IU student studying music, I had totally the wrong metric. My metric for success in practicing and preparation was always time. I would always go to the practice rooms. I'd basically lock myself in a room with no windows and I would get out a watch and I would put in 60, 90, you know, 120 minutes, take a break. And I was putting in hours and hours of practice in a day. In addition to classes and my part-time job and rehearsals, it was crazy. But what I didn't do is always keep clear goals. Gary asks, do you find the harder you grind on things you lose, interrupt the process, or time to brainstorm? Well, how you work is specific to you. I can tell you how I work. I tend to be a limited multitasker. Um, in my shop, because I have CNC machines, I often am managing multiple machines at once. And I'm also answering emails and some text messages and returning phone calls. And if I get more than two or three things going at once in a shop, my productivity plummets. I can't do four or five things at once. But I'm also under pressure, pressure from myself, to, to rarely let myself monotask. Although sometimes monotasking is exactly what I have to do, either because of a, a time deadline, like this is the one thing that absolutely has to happen today, everything else is secondary. If nothing else happens today, but this one thing gets done, that's fine, I monotask. I would just be zoned in on that one thing, and I would work and work and work on it till it's done. I work well that way, but doing that regularly every day of the week in the shop is not going to maximize my productivity. The way I maximize my productivity is keeping a reasonable number of plates, a reasonable number of balls juggling in the air 
so that I've got the mill cycling and I've got the big vacuum former running and I've got a couple different things going on and so I'm basically doubling up my man hours. I've got more than one machine running for each hour I put in out here. Um, but sometimes I just have to stop. Sometimes, you know, if I'm, if I'm having trouble with an idea um, or I'm having trouble with part of the process, something is not turning out well, sometimes I can just troubleshoot quickly on the fly, find a good solution and keep on rolling without losing momentum. Sometimes stuff goes really wrong, okay? Um, if I'm making individual holsters, maybe I scrap a unit. Maybe I scrap two or three. Uh, if I'm machining and something goes really wrong and I like break an end mill or I wreck some material and don't have any more, um, something happens where I get derailed. Then I'll often just take a few minutes, I'll walk outside the shop, I'll sweep the floor. For me, sweeping the floor is very therapeutic. I like to do it. Um, and so sometimes I just take five minutes and just sweep. I don't do anything else. I don't try to think about anything else. I just sweep. That helps me. Do I work in stages or finishes, finish holsters in whole? Robert Arango, I almost never finish holsters entire. I batch virtually everything. I batch the forming. I batch the drilling. I batch the pre-cutting. I batch the trim routing. I batch the folding. I batch the polishing. And I batch the assembly. The only time I do a holster entire is if I have one odds and ends thing, you know, say I had five holsters in inventory of one model and I get six orders and I need to make just one more. Ideally, I'd run a small batch of 10 or so. Um, but then I would usually form 10, five or 10, and then take one, drill it, trim it, route it, finish it, fold it, assemble it, so I can at least fill that order. But it's never my preference to do one unit start to finish if I can avoid it. I work better batching things in stages. It allows me to get into a groove. I'm a rhythm kind of person. I like setting eyelets. I like drilling holes on the drill press. I like doing moderately repetitive things. And if I can get in a groove and do something 30, 40, 50, 100 times, I get a lot faster each time. Hello, Steve Weininger. Hope your arm is all the way better now. Um, the trade-off is sometimes batching can mean you screw up a whole batch of stuff. You screw up one step on all of them. And so anytime I'm doing something new, if I've ever got something brand new, it's a modified mold, it's a new piece of hardware, I'm trying out a different type of plastic. If there's, if there's new variables, then I work one or two entire to the end because it's not worth it, the risk of making 30 and having them be bad outweighs the small loss of efficiency to run one or two entire to verify that, yes, this trims properly. Yes, it fits well. Yes, the ride height is where I want. Yes, the hardware works. If I don't verify that stuff and I run a whole bunch and they're all bad and they all get pitched, I have wasted way more time than I ever gained. Steve, I'm glad to hear you love the holster. Um, one of these times, one of these weeks I had to come out for a ride along. Steve is one of my local law enforcement officers who carries Henry holsters. Um, and so depending on what I'm making, if it's a known product and I've made hundreds of them, I just batch and batch and batch. Occasionally I'll pause and finish one through just to verify, make sure everything's good. But generally once a, once a process is dialed in, there's not a lot of point to, uh, to going over and checking it over and over and over again. You check as much as you need to to feel comfortable and if you have problems, if you get bad feedback or at the end you, you do QC and something's not right, you find the problem and fix it. But as much as I can, I prefer to batch. Um, so bad grind is doing something that's not working and trying it over and over and over. Bad grind is trying to fix something when I should throw it away and just go again. I don't know how many times I have told myself Oh man, that holster is just not gonna. That's that's eh, just not gonna be good. And I think, man, if I just spend five more minutes, I can fix it. What always happens is, I waste five minutes. I can't fix it. I end up throwing it away anyway, and I wasted time. Okay, almost never. Like uh, if I'm swift pressing stuff, and I'm going as fast as I can, and I miss a line of piece, and I don't get a good seal, and the part does not form well the first time. Trash. 
straight to the trash. I don't even consider trying to do anything else with it. If it's not flat anymore and it's cooled down, reasonably cooled down, and I can't easily quickly flatten it, trash. It's worth nothing to me. It's not worth a second of my time to think about. Um, I've gotten better at quickly making a decision. That's a lost cause. Trash it. Move on. And that's part of good grind. That's working smarter so that I don't waste my work harder on dumb stuff. Um, and so the work harder, work smarter thing is another place where good grind and bad grind are involved. So if, if your goal is just work harder, work harder, work harder, that's bad grind or can become bad grind. Work smarter does not mean work less hard. It just means have clear goals, have a careful plan, and pursue it intelligently. Just be smart about what you're working on. That doesn't have anything to do with intensity. You can work stupid and really slow and inefficiently. You can also work smart with incredible focus and intensity and just be cutting through a pile of work, just ripping through it. And so my goal is always to work smarter and harder. But if I have problems, if it starts getting bumpy, more and more I'm recognizing that it's better to quickly take a step back early on rather than try to just you know buckle down and keep charging through, hoping that the problem will just solve itself without me thinking about it carefully. Problems in this shop rarely solve themselves accidentally. Unless I make a deliberate decision and implement a solution, the problem stays a problem. And if something is a problem, it was a problem last batch and it bothered me, but I didn't take time to fix it. I just said, okay, I'm only doing 10. I'll just buckle down. I'll get through it. Yes, it's a pain, but I'll just, I'll deal with it later. I do 10. I put it off. I don't fix it. The next batch comes up. It's 25. And I go, oh man, I didn't fix that thing. I'm out of, I don't have time today. I'm just going to put my head down and charge through. Every time you choose to not solve a problem that you could solve that costs you time, you are working harder and dumber. You're working less smart because you're throwing away time. You're paying that inefficiency in time. You're wasting money and time. Every time you go through that process and that inefficient step is there. Um, this is the case with jigs and fixtures. Um, if you make a jig, say a, a drilling jig or, or you make your own trim mold, okay? Jigs and fixtures are only useful as far as they are accurate and repeatable. If a jig works great, but it doesn't work quite the same each batch, like you never get it in quite the same spot and it's never quite the same after the first time, not productive. If you spend an hour making a jig and you still have to clean up each piece afterwards because they're real close, but they're not quite right, it would have been better to spend two hours and get it dead nuts on so that every time you use it, there's no cleanup afterwards. Um, jigs and fixtures that are 90% there drive me bananas because it's like it's tantalizing. You can almost, you can taste the possible efficiency and it's just beyond reach. You're not getting it. You can see it. You can imagine it. You know what it would be. And every time you use that tool, you're not getting that efficiency because you didn't stick with it to the bitter end and make it happen. Um, and so if I find myself grinding through a process that frustrates me because it doesn't work well, and rather than stepping back and fixing it, I just keep going through it over and over, that's a recipe for burnout. That's a recipe for frustration. That's a recipe for me getting home and being angry with my kids in the evening because all afternoon I was angry at myself because I was making a bad decision over and over and over and over and over and over and I knew it was bad and I just pretended it wasn't happening and just kept going, 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 going. That's bad grind. Thumbs down on that. 90% jigs. Yeah, when it comes to fixing a process, 
In many cases, a 90% solution is worse than no solution at all because it, it sucks up a bunch of time on the front end. You develop a new solution, you build it, you get almost over the top and you're stuck there. Okay? It's like, uh, it's like climbing a rock climbing wall. You get to like the third from the end handhold and you're just there. Okay? Miserable. Ben, glad you picked up a mag carrier and flat pack. Hope you like those. Um, my internet is working now, said Conrad. Well, welcome back to us with high speed internet connections. It's been blissful here. Um, and so, whenever I'm looking at a solution for something in my shop, like today, uh, there were a few things I worked on where I just said, you know what? I'm going to turn, I turned the mill off, I turned the big vacuum former off. I just said for the next hour, I'm just not going to do anything on those. My mill sat idle for most of the afternoon today, and I worked on other stuff. Uh, I built a little reflector frame for the top heating elements on my side. That had been a project that needed to happen and needed to happen, and I kept putting it off and kept putting it off. And every time I ran parts, I was frustrated by a few things that were happening because I hadn't stopped and fixed it. I was just trying to just keep going. So I fixed that. And it works better. It's, I'm going to have to make some adjustments to my time and temperature recipe on the machine, but it's very promising. It definitely helped. Um, what else did I do today? Uh, I cleaned off and reorganized a bench that is my like screw and bolt hardware bench that just gradually overflows into this disaster of mix and match you know, mess. Um, Built that badass vacuum piece on the router too, Ian. I'm not sure what you mean, Gary. Um, but having lots of fun. Uh, the piece that I put on the vacuum today, I just made. I had just cut up and bent some sheet metal. Uh, nothing real fancy. I just hung it up with like picture wire twine metal. Really simple, low tech. I just needed to test the idea out. So I cut up some strips, made a four-sided frame, attached it at four corners, and hung it up in the machine to see if I could get a little bit better heat out to the edges of my forming area on the big machine. Uh, dust collector. Yeah, so this is a thing. Oh, the, uh, built that badass thing on the router. Yeah, the table router. Yes, I finally said, I'm done with the router throwing all these chips uh, over onto my drill press table. I just got tired of it. Um, and I could have spent time trying to make a perfect solution. But for that, all I needed was something to trap the chips. They're all flying in the same direction. Just tape a cardboard box to the table, get a, get a knife and cut a hole in the back, punch a shot back through it. That's a good enough solution for now. It solved the presenting problem. It's not an optimal solution, but it works. It keeps me from having to sweep off the drill press table again and again and again because I've got all kinds of drill bits and other stuff on there. And when all those little flaky, staticky codex chips get on that table, cleaning that table once takes way more time than making that goofy cardboard dust collector jig did. Any recommendation on molds currently on the market to try making outside the waistband holsters with the Swift Press? Um, ben, the two mold solutions I would recommend um, for outside the waistband holsters, I would say look very seriously at the aluminum molds from Conrad Miller. They're modular. You can separate them into two halves or put them together and make a full gun, which means you can take them and you can mount them apart and press front and back. You can build them onto angle jigs. They're compatible with the Red Eye Tactical Angle Backers, which, full disclosure, I make for him. Um, or you could get somebody like Conrad or me or somebody else who does molds to uh, design and make for you a fully integrated outside the waistband holster mold. Uh, I do make those. They're pretty expensive where it's a gun half and integrated wings and uh, all the drill points marked, everything involved, uh, everything you're going to have to drill and cut, they're all there in the mold. They're pretty complicated. It takes some time to design and test and revise and redesign and retest and finally settle down on. Um, but they make a great product. They're just expensive and time consuming. Um, depending on your budget, I would say probably if you can swing it, pick your most popular model, get one aluminum split mold from Conrad Miller, and figure out how you want to do outside the waistband holsters on a Swift Press. Test it out. Uh, and then 
then bring on online additional models. Don't try to do three or four or five at once because doing outside the waistbands on a Swift press is going to involve some changes and some tweaks to your process. Um, if you've ever made, if you've never made holsters before that have integrated wing angles off the mold, it's a great time saver. You don't have to heat up and bend the wings, but it also complicates certain things. It's a little harder to line up your eyelets and to drill things because you're no longer dealing with flat wings. You've got angles. Stuff can get a little goofy. Hello, Tony. Alameda Holsters is in the house. Thank you for stopping by. Um, and so, um, good grind is goal focused. I mentioned that before. I talked about Gary Vaynerchuk, clouds and dirt. Grind that is focused on your big picture goals is productive grind. Even if it doesn't produce the maximum output of stuff now, if it's moving you downfield toward the end zone, toward the goal you're wanting to arrive at, that's good grind. Okay? Any grind that doesn't move you in that direction, no matter how satisfying the grind is, uh, no matter how intense it is, no matter how awesome it seems at the time, if it's not moving you toward your big picture goal, it's bad grind. Okay? Um, an example of this, I think, is picking up a new mold to make a one-off or an odds and ends holster. Okay? I consider that to be a bad decision, and any time you spend crushing it to make that one weirdo model is bad grind because it doesn't move you in the direction you want to go in unless those unusual guns are what you want to major in. And uh, it's not that making unusual combinations is automatically bad. There's white space. There's room in the market for holster makers to really specialize in things that other guys don't support. If you wanted to specialize in SIGs, if you wanted to specialize in XDs and Rugers, if you wanted to specialize in revolvers, if you wanted to specialize in left-handed holsters, if you wanted to specialize in lasers only, like guns with lasers, that's all you offer. Um, if you find a niche and it's a legit niche and there's some volume there and you really drive your grind toward developing good products that you can produce effectively, consistently in that niche, that's great grind. It's not that popular things are good grind and unpopular things are bad grind. It's things that don't move you in the direction you want to take your business. If your goal was to have a CNC driven process with non-membrane vacuum forming where you quickly and repeatedly produce hundreds of copies a week of five or six basic models, then picking up, uh, what did I see today, like a Beretta uh, PX4 Compact with TLR3 or TLR4, that moves you in the wrong direction. Because if you make that and the guy who got it shows his buddy, he's like, oh, awesome, I have one of those too. Okay? Whatever you make, you will tend to get more orders of. If you post pictures on social media of Desert Eagle drop leg rigs, guess what you're going to get orders for? Every bro who's got a Desert Eagle that he wants to carry on a thigh rig is going to see that and go, yes, finally, somebody who makes Kydex for my Desert Eagle drop leg. And they're going to message you. I got to a point where I just said, if I don't want to make it a hundred times, I don't want to make it once. If I am not down for making it over and over and over and over, I don't want to make it a single time. Because it is not going to be a good return on my investment, of my time, of my energy, of my thoughtfulness. So this, is, this is my rule now. If I'm going to make it once, I have to be willing to make it a hundred times. Seriously. I look at stuff and think, and it's everything. It's not just holsters. If it's CNC machine product. Now, is I mean, Obviously, every custom mold I make is a custom mold. They're a little different. But um, I had somebody reach out to me this week in an email with some photos and a write-up. They wanted a certain product, and they said, do you think you can make this cost-effectively? And I looked at it, and I thought, maybe, but I don't even want to make it once. I definitely don't want to make 100 of those. And so um, if I... Uh, if I make something that I don't want to continue making, I am headed in the wrong direction. I, I'm losing yardage. I'm passing back. Um, because whatever you do, whatever you advertise, whatever you show on social media is what people are going to associate you with. Um, 
I had kind of a weird interim period where I was still taking, you know, because I liked, I liked doing, at some level, I liked doing local, in-person, one-off custom stuff for guys I've met at gun shows, local, you know, local gun store, guys who I know locally, if they want an unusual holster, I used to still make appointments and have guys come to my shop and get something made while they wait. And it got to the point where every time I did that, I would give them the little warranty spiel, the maintenance thing, you know, lock tight your hardware, this and that. And then I would say, since this is a custom, please don't post pictures of it on social media. I actually got to a point where I was um, asking people not to post customs on social media because invariably what would happen would be some local guy would come in with an unusual rig, I'd make a holster, he'd post a picture on social media, and over the next week I'd get emails from dudes in California and Florida and New Hampshire and all over the place saying, hey, I saw that holster on your, on your, on, on, that you made for so-and-so, can you make me one? And I have to waste my time and their time, you know, and then email them back and say, I'm really sorry, you sound super excited, I don't actually have a mold for that, I did a one-off using the customer's gun and here's weirdo light, and I'm sorry I can't help you, okay? So that one order, which usually was time inefficient to start with, because customs, especially on real guns, block everything up, tape everything up, make the holster, then strip everything off, then test fit, you know, it's, it's nowhere near as time effective as making one off a purpose-built mold. And then that one order, which already stunk on an efficiency level from the get-go, then sucks up time every time I get an email, a text, a Facebook message, an Instagram DM, a comment on a post, every single time that holster resurfaces, it costs me more time and I make no more dollars off it. Dan Taylor, if you buy a mold, get it dialed in and make enough holsters to pay for itself, why get rid of it? So it depends. So if you're talking about buying a multi-mold, and making a dozen holsters on it in a foam press and it pays for itself, yeah, feel free to keep it. You may use it again. Okay? What I found is when I made the transition from foam pressing to membrane forming and then from membrane forming to non-membrane forming, many of my molds were no longer compatible with my process. And it made zero sense to keep an inefficient, obsolete, and frustrating process in service just for the sake of squeaking a little more mileage out of occasionally used molds. That was a losing proposition all round. Okay? Turning people down, um, it's, it's, it's discouraging, it makes me feel bad. I don't like saying no to people. I, I don't like having somebody come to me excited to ask about something and the instant they open their mouth and I hear the words SIG P2 and I just go, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to stop you there. Okay? Or I hear, you know, I have a Bursa, hang on. Or this new Ruger, nope. Okay? That's discouraging. Um, and that's the other part, Skylar, that's probably even a bigger deal for me. When I do things that are outside my zone, things that I do not have dialed in, I'm careful, I'm meticulous. I'm trying to work quick. I'm trying to get the customer good product, but I find if I do custom, and whenever I did customs, I had to go back to foam pressing. I was never, ever, ever happy with the work because I'd gotten so accustomed to the increased consistency, the quality of fit, everything that came with the new improved process that turning the clock back two years and using the old process was really discouraging. Okay. Yeah, you, you, you don't want to say, try to find ways to minimize negative contact with your customers. Negative contact is, uh, warranties can often turn into negative contact. Uh, they're not always. That's an, a warranty claim is a fantastic opportunity for you to go above and beyond and show exceptional customer service and build really good brand equity and potentially, although not guaranteed, potentially great word of mouth marketing from an ongoing client. But some warranty stuff can turn into negative contacts. So, you know, um, 
anytime somebody calls you up or messages you or emails you and is excited, um, I think it's you, Steve. I don't think it's me. I'm not sure. Uh, if a customer is excited and they come to you and they're really excited about something and you have to say no, that's bad. If you can structure your customer contact and website and order process to eliminate that as much as possible, to funnel those things out or make it clear from the get-go what you do and don't do, what you will and won't make, everybody stays happier. No customer likes being led on. Don't, don't hem and haw and say, maybe, you know, I, just, I just say no to customs anymore. And um, I find it makes my life easier, and it also makes life less complicated for my customers. Okay? I have other holster makers that I regularly refer business to. Anytime I get a request for a custom, I just, depending on what it is, I refer them to one or four or five guys who I know do good work on a reasonable time frame and say, I'm sorry, I don't offer that, but this guy does really good work for that style of holster. You should check him out. Um, and so if you ever do have to say no, a customer contacts you and they want something you don't offer, um, the sooner and more clearly you say no. Don't, don't say like, well, I mean, don't hedge, don't hem and haw. If you don't want to do it and you're, you want to you walk away from it, say no. Don't qualify it. Don't, don't conditional it. Don't say, well, you know, somebody, somebody sends you a picture of some stupid gun light combination. And they say, hey, can you make a holster for this? And you have a mold for the gun, but you won't have a mold for the light because the light is garbage. One of the Glock OEM lights. Okay? And if you email them back, and you say, I'm sorry, I would love to help, but I can't make a holster for that combination. I don't have that light. What you're hoping they'll say is, oh, well, okay, I guess I'll go someplace else. But what will actually happen is they'll say, well, I mean, uh, well, what if I ship it to you? And you go, oh, okay, uh, I just want this guy to go away. I don't want to make this thing. Okay? Be, be clear. Be direct, straightforward. Don't say, I would love to, but... Because if, you, if you're turning it down, you wouldn't love to. That's why you're turning it down. And if you're disingenuous, if you're insincere, like, oh, I would love to help, but I... Uh, no. Guess what? That's BS, and customers can pick up on that. And they will. Um, say, I'm not going to make... Uh, just, just, I'm not offering anything for that model. I'm not offering that style of holster. I don't offer anything that fits your needs. Okay? It's, it's not an invitation for further discussion. It's not a negotiation. It's not conditional. It's not asking them to send you the light. It's not any of those things. Okay? If, it's, if you're going to end up at a no, okay, the faster and cleaner you can make that, the better. Okay? And besides, you should be in your shop grinding. Okay? You should be getting that good grind going. You should be focused on the stuff you want to make that moves you towards your end goal. Not on stuff that moves you backwards or just keeps you cycling in one place. Okay? Stuff that prevents you from making forward progress is negative. Get rid of it. I have gained new business and grown customers doing a handful of guns, being able to have them in a day. Yeah, I think generally, Mike, uh, the make every customer their own unique snowflake holster business model, uh, it seems like that, that's where you have to end up. If you believe the customer is always right, which is not true, customers are often wrong, uh, oftentimes a lot of the sting of not being able to get your own individual unique snowflake holster, a lot of that sting is taken away by being able to get a holster that's very close to what you want in three days rather than six weeks. Okay? Jace, that's a great idea. Having a quickly written up uh, response that you can just pull in and drop off and it covers the bases clearly, I don't offer that. 
If I do in the future, I'll let you know. That's awesome. Um, finding, finding ways to streamline that as much as possible. If you get contacts and you have a contact where you have to say no, make it clean, make it clear, unambiguous, and get back to your good grind. Um, taking on a project you don't want to do that's going to take too much time, that's going to produce a subpar product compared to what you can do on your optimized process, there's no reason to go to any of those. That's like strike, 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 and you're still at bat. You're like eight strikes in, and you're still at bat. What are you doing? Okay. Yeah, it's it's harder. Um, if they want something really weird, it's just a bad idea. It's just a terrible combo, or it's just, just a, it's a bad carry solution. Uh, sometimes you won't be able to give them a recommendation because no responsible holster maker will make what they want. I don't know if I've mentioned this before. Last year there was a, a thread on Facebook that went viral. And it was a dude with uh, an XDM Compact and a Protec Light. Now, if you know the XDM Compact, it's not compatible with that light. He had actually dremeled off the front half of the trigger guard in order to put the light on. Okay? And this, this picture was uh, being posted on some gunsmith Facebook groups and things. And guys were just beside themselves laughing at this guy. I can't believe he did that, so and so. Okay? That dude was in my shop the day before that picture went viral. That gun was on my bench. Okay? That was one of those, that was. That was a turning point moment for me, okay? Because I've had customers request, and I have made holsters that were less than ideal. That either the carry method, you know, whatever it is, there's something about the, the design, not the execution of it, but the design, the features, that I'm not fully on board with. If it's unsafe, I say no. Okay, but if it's like, oh, okay, I wouldn't do it that way, but I suppose you can, I used to make some of those. I'm not proud of it. I don't do it anymore. Um, but this was, you know, the guy had emailed me. He got a contact to a local gun store. He said he wanted to come out and get an appendix holster for an XDM with a light. I thought, great, XDM with a light. I can do that. He'll bring his gun. He'll bring his light. It'll be fine. Okay. When he came out here and handed me that, and I took the light off and I looked at this with the trigger guard cut off and he wanted an appendix holster. I'm looking at this going, like the guy drove 45 minutes to get here and he's here in my shop, he's standing right here looking at me and I said, I'm sorry, I am not going to be able to make a holster for this. Guess what happened? Any guesses? I'll take a minute. I'm going to sip some water. I want to see some comments. Guess what happened? Hey, my sister Maureen is here. Hello, Maureen. So when I told the guy, I cannot make a holster for this, post a comment. Let me know your guess. What happened? He won't guess. I'm not seeing any comments. Maybe mine are frozen. I'm going to keep rolling. Okay? Here's what happened. He got upset. I'm sure you saw that coming. Yeah. He's like, well, why can't you? He didn't go ballistic, Ben, but he was, he was upset. He's like, man, I don't understand. Like, I drove, I drove here. He started to cuss a little bit, but here's, I, mean, I, I basically said, this is unsafe. I can't make a holster for it. And he basically said, well, you know, um, he did offer to pay extra. He, he wanted to, he basically said, well, I don't understand why it's a problem. I'm taking on the liability. Like, I'm the one. And what he failed to recognize is that if I put my name, if I put my brand, no, seriously, Ben, compensation for the drive. Uh, if I put my brand, my name, 
on a holster that is specifically designed around a gun light combination that can only be possible if you modify the firearm in a ridiculously unsafe way, that one custom order is going to be a is going to be an iceberg that sinks my brand. Okay? I was looking right at the decision between make this one customer happy, make one of the worst business decisions of my entire life. Because eventually I knew that gun was going to go viral somewhere. Somebody would see it at a range somewhere. Somebody would see it. A picture would get posted or the guy would try to sell it and a picture would get posted and you know whose name would get brought up? Me. Because it'd be getting sold or it'd be in the picture with a custom holster made by Henry Holsters. And at that point, my brand, <clears throat> Toast. Hindenburg. Yeah, totally. Disaster. So the guy was upset. Like, really upset. Now, it's hard to kick a dude with a gun out of your shop. Sometimes you have to do it. And so what ended up happening was he left. He drove to the next town. He bought a different gun. He came back to the shop. I made him a holster for the different gun with a, a light on it and gave him a steep discount as compensation for his drive time. He was happy. He got an appendix holster. Hey, not 24 hours later, not 24 hours later, that gun was viral on Facebook. And it's like, I had this feeling like, if you, if you guys ever read Captain's Courageous, great book, Rudyard Kipling, you should read it. There's a scene where Harvey is standing at the railing of the We're Here in the fog off the Grand Banks, and he hears a, a, a liner's uh, horn whistle in the fog. And then just for a second, he feels this weird feeling, and then right in front of his face, just over the railing, a line of brass portholes of this big ocean liner go flashing past. Okay? Absolutely would have crushed the boat if they'd been a few feet further over. Okay? I, it was like... I felt like I had turned around and a truck just went whoosh, right in front of my face. I dodged a bullet on that one. Okay? And for the sake of making one customer happy, for grinding an hour and making that weird, awful combination, I could have, um, I could have made a, a holster I hated and trashed my brand all in one week. Okay? Kyle Shook, you joke about being the SIG guy, but you know what? I don't think SIG Sour is going anywhere. I think Sig Sauer is going to have a lot of guns out there for a long time. Hey, if you decided to do that, guess what? I think you could have a very successful business focusing on SIGs. Hey, if you, if, but you'd really have to dial that. You would have to get an intensive collection of all the different models of SIGs. You'd have to know by serial number and by spec to be able to distinguish all the unmarked variations, you'd have to be able to tell a customer explicitly um, what features on their firearm you need to know in order to properly ID it and make it a compatible holster. Okay? Yeah, seriously, if there's one thing that's true, like guys who buy SIGs can afford to spend money on holsters. How do we know that? Because they're buying SIGs. SIGs are not an entry-level firearm. They're not a budget thing. Okay. You probably will need an arsenal of guns or you'll at least need access to a local SIG dealer, somebody who's got a decent supply of them. Hello, Booth. Thank you for stopping by. I just finished telling my XDM with ProTech horror story, and it was a horror story. Man. My go-to guy that I refer any SIG order to is Caleb Dahl at Stature Man. Uh, I don't think he's the be-all, end-all of SIG holster setups, but... He has got more time and energy invested in them than I do, and he's got more of their models figured out and dialed in than I do, than I ever had. I don't do any SIGs, uh, any of the P200 series anymore. Um, 
Although, I, actually, that's not true. I just started doing the 238 molds. Um, so, good grind moves you downfield. So, Kyle Shook, you'll be my case study. Good grind for Kyle Shook is, tonight, since he's made the decision to go all in, all sig, what Kyle Shook should do is sit down with a beer, go to his web store, and start cutting things off the drop-down menus. Ditch Glock, m &P, XD, Ruger, Walter, all of it gone, okay? And then start changing his branding, lay out a strategy for Instagram posts, everything he's going to do, figure out how he's going to market as we are the SIG experts in the holster field, okay? And if you can set those goals and grind and grind and grind toward them, I think you could make a successful business there. I don't think 40 holster makers could make a successful business there, but I think there's room for a handful. And because so many guys cry when somebody tries to order a SIG, I think if there were a really, really awesome option on the market and you were totally dialed in on SIGs and guys could refer clients to you and just say, look, if you need a SIG, Kyle Shook is the guy, you'd get a lot of referrals. I'd refer people to you. Um, and so if you were to grind in that direction, that's scrub everything that's not SIG off your website, that is create a hit list of all the SIGs you're going to start buying based on order of priority and start budgeting for them. That's start making phone calls to SIG Sour US and finding all the big distributors in your area. Find out who has SIGs in stock, find out what they have, make some drives, get good calipers, go and establish your own bank of on the spot, dead accurate, by model um, measurements. That's also reach out to Sig Sauer, get a hold of somebody who's not a front desk kind of person, get, try it, work your way to somebody on the inside and say, look, this is what I'm doing. I am investing the time and energy and money to support aftermarket holsters for all the detailed Sig variations and, and discrepancies. Like, you know, if you want to be the guy, go to SIG, tell them what you're doing, ask for their support, ask for help figuring out what the variations actually are. When did model revisions happen? You know, how many models of 229 are there actually? How many models of 226 are there actually? How many models of 2022 are there actually? And what are the critical differences? If you can get that from the horse's mouth, if you can get that information from SIG, do it. If you can show them that you're serious, that, you're, that your website is all SIG, that your Instagram feed is like SIG life, yo, uh, then you have a chance to actually, um, actually go there. But if five days a week you're still taking stupid one-off orders for a Ruger here, a Walter there, an XDS here, uh, a Glock 36 here, you're hurting yourself, okay? That, even though you might be grinding your way through those customs and making a decent amount of money per hour doing it, that's bad grind. It's not moving you downfield towards your goal. I mean, Kyle, I'm dead serious. If, if I was going to go all in on SIGs tonight, that's what I would do. I would scrub the website tonight. I would join SIG forums. I would... Tomorrow and over the next few weeks, I would start blowing up SIG's phone and email. I would start going through their company directory any way I could. I would reach out to people. I would look at who SIG-sponsored shooters are. I'd find them on social media. I'd DM them. I'd talk to them. I would find out, you know, I would start eating, breathing, sleeping SIG, okay? I would make a point of finding out who in local USPSA and local IDPA shoots SIGs. I would get on SIG forums and I would try to find anybody in my area, anybody within a one hour driving distance who's a SIG owner, an avid SIG shooter. I want their contact info. I want them to know about me. I'll give them, you know, once I launch new stuff, my local SIG owners, especially if they shoot USPSA, they shoot IDPA, or they use social media well, those guys are fantastic because you know in more, I'm not going to call a SIG niche because it's huge, but in, in more particularized fields, like guys who are all in on CZ or all in on SIG or all, 
you know, all in on some particular brand, excuse me, all, all in on HK, those guys tend to have online communities. And if you can get good word in there, if you can get good reviews, if you can get good, uh, good buzz, that can grow really rapidly. You're not going to scale up to all the SIG models all at once, but seriously, if you decided over the next uh, six weeks to do to really, really, really dig in on 10 SIG variants, I think you could make bank. Um, six Sour Holsters. Jace, that's a great idea. You should get that royalty check. I would have gone with Suck Sour, but that's just because I'm a CZ guy. Actually, I don't own any CZs yet. But I think the, the CZ guys call it the Zickness, the CZ Ickness. Um, I'm actually going to the gun store tomorrow to pick up my first CZ. Kind of excited about it. Got a P09. Um, so that'll be on my Instagram tomorrow. Um, and so if you have goals, you can, you can focus on that good grind. If you don't have goals, the grind is just driving in circles. The grind is just charging around with no game plan. And you may make progress. You may make product. You may make some money. But if you have aimless grind, 12 months from now, you're going to find yourself basically where you are now. You will not have gotten where you wanted to get by accident. It's like getting in a car and just driving somewhere. If you don't have a destination, you're just driving. It doesn't matter how fast you go, you're getting somewhere. Um, so that's my take on good grind versus bad grind. It's all about goals and a willingness to step back from the grind because stepping back from the physical grind, stepping back from the drill press, Stepping back from the buffer wheel, buffing wheel, stepping back from the sander, stepping back from the press, and engaging even more intensely mentally to troubleshoot, to problem solve, to upgrade the process. That's grind. Grind is not only physical. Grind is so, um, so total. Okay. Good grind is where your goals, your mental energy. Your physical energy and your hours are all clearly focused on one thing. Like, and and give yourself deadlines. Okay, you know we're back. We're back to Kyle Shook with six sour or slick sour holsters. Um, six weeks from now, I'm going to have ten variants on my website. Six months from now, I'm going to have twenty five. Okay, two weeks from now, I'm going to have. Two, I'm gonna. I'm going to have um, two weeks from now. I'm going to have a list of at least ten significant influencers that I've identified on Instagram, Facebook, and on the Sig forums. I'm gonna have their contact info. I'm gonna have what they carry, what they shoot, and I'm gonna prioritize getting gear into their hands so that they can start creating the buzz in that online community. Two weeks. 10 influencers. Um, I'm going to spend 45 minutes a day sitting down on Instagram and going over all the SIG specific hashtags I can. And I'm going to go back literally thousands of posts. Okay. And I'm not just going to say, hey, I'm the new SIG holster maker in town. I'm just going to comment on their stuff. I'm going to comment on people's posts. Man, that looks totally great. I really love that Legion. You know, whatever it is. Without trying to sell anything, just engage. Talk to them on their page. If your company name has SIG or something that indicates SIG, um, in the company name where they hop on your page and you know your tagline on your Instagram profile is, we love SIGs. We specialize in SIGs. Okay? If they're a SIG user, a SIG shooter, and they find a holster company that specializes in SIGs commenting on their Sig Sauer pistol post from the range from six months ago, I bet you'll get engagement. They'll be interested. They'll at least chat back. They'll answer you. They might follow your page. Um, that would be good grind. Social media, it can be grind. Okay, Printing off shipping labels is grind. Updating the website is grind. That's a grind I really don't like, but it's a grind. 
if you're updating your website with the goal of getting where you want to go, eliminating models you no longer offer, discarding options you don't want to sell, getting rid of colors that you only ever make once in a blue moon and you hate even keeping the plastic on the shelf. Okay? If your website work moves you downfield toward those goals, that's good grind. Good grind is not just about Kydex dust. It's not just about running machines. Uh, conversely, if you spend your time, if you're going to focus on SIGs, but you spend a lot of social media time just wandering around. Hey, cool, bacon. Hey. That can be fun. It can be relaxation, but it's not grind. It's not moving you downfield towards your goal. So I'm going to close it up for tonight. I got some other stuff to do here in the shop. It's been a busy day for me. Um, I got some, uh, some fixtures to install on the machine so I can do a bunch of parts trimming tomorrow. Um, yeah, if you have measurable goals, if you have goals that are clear, they have a time frame attached, they're measurable with stepping stones, you can actually say, okay, you know, this is the goal, it's in four parts. ETA on CNC Part 2 broadcast. Bill, that's happening next week. CNC Part 2 will be next week. Okay? Thank you all very much for coming around. I appreciate you guys spending your Thursday evening with me. I really enjoy making these Facebook broadcasts. Uh, I love reading your comments. I like, I like seeing the banter. I like seeing you guys help each other, encourage each other, and make fun of each other. I love it. Uh, so please, if you enjoy these broadcasts, if you think they're valuable to you, help me get more people here to share them and enjoy them. Um, yeah, next week after Conrad Miller gets his Doosan VMC in shop, we will have the CNC Part 2 Facebook Live broadcast. Justin Garner, you are here just in time for me to sign off, man. We are just calling it a night. And I promise, Justin, those single stack mag carriers will happen someday. Best I got for you at the moment. Um, so that's that. I appreciate it. Please do share and like the feed. Um, Tell other holster makers about it. If you enjoyed it, please comment on the Facebook post about it. Comment on the Instagram post that uh, gave the time so people can see that there's good engagement here, there's interesting content, and it's worth coming and checking out. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great night. Till next time, grind hard, grind smart, grind good. <laughs>